live from the Mission Bay Conference Center in San Francisco, California. It's The Cube at Google Cloud Platform Live. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live, this is theCUBE in San Francisco, California for Google Platform Conference Live. The Developer Conference for the Cloud. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Valley. I'm Jeff Frick, my co-host. Uh, we're excited to have CUBE alumni, but also man about town, coming to talk about containers, Kubernetes. We have Craig McLucky, product manager at Google. Name the product, Kubernetes. Welcome back. Thank you, it's great to be back on the CUBE. As I said, you're the man about town. Containers are the hottest thing going on, really enabling a lot of new change, a lot of, a lot of um, solidarity in the developer community around bringing cloud together, right? You're seeing people go, wow, Containers are not a new concept. Docker has brought together the concept and made huge push. Just the ball gets moved down the field big time. And then Kubernetes kind of tying it all together and you guys are open sourcing it. So, you know, I want to first talk about, from your perspective, what's changed since VMware? Where we, we had a great conversation around Kubernetes. Obviously that was front and center in VMware show, mm -hmm. which is a huge IT enterprise uh, vote of confidence. To now, here at Google, core developers, large scale, back-end network interconnect stuff going on. You almost connect the dots, right? Native developers really cranking out the apps, large scale interconnect. Uh, there's a lot in the middle there between those bookends. What's changed? So a couple things I think have changed since I last spoke to um, the Cube and at, at VMworld. The first is we've seen an amazing amount of velocity around the Kubernetes community. Um, not just what Google's been doing, but also what our open source community members have been contributing. And we're seeing um, a very fast acceleration of the overall platform, moving quickly towards operational maturity, being, you know, getting closer to production readiness, and introducing a lot of features that are really needed uh, to both run real world applications and uh, to go to new places, to, to go to a variety of new clouds. So uh, we're seeing the, the reality of a very highly portable and maturing way to, to build container-based applications emerging. That's been very exciting. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting here is um, the way that uh, we at Google have been introducing Kubernetes directly into the Google Cloud Platform. Today we announced a new product called Google Container Engine, which provides the quickest and easiest way to get a Kubernetes cluster up and running and managed for you on Google Cloud Platform. And we're very excited about how easy it's making our, for our customers to access this new way of, of building applications. Talk about this con container engine, because obviously App Engine had huge success. A little bit of learning curve, but you guys have some core front end developers. Making, you're, you're making that easier now, but what is a container engine? Is it a Docker engine? Is it Docker compatible? Is it a whole new animal? What is it? What is it? That's great. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I, th I would start by saying this. At Google, we have Google Compute Engine, which offers powerful, flexible, fast-booting VMs. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've had App Engine, which offers a highly managed, very efficient way to get web applications up and running. And what we've encountered with our customers is that there is no natural way to move from one world to the other world. There's no connective tissue that exists in the middle that lets our customers think about building applications that are running on a cloud computer rather than just running on a virtual machine. And so what Google Container Engine is, is uh, a technology that lets our customers program at the cluster level. So Docker has provided this amazingly productive way to package up an application and deploy it into a node. So Docker has, has done a great job of, of taking a lot of technologies that existed and making them incredibly accessible to developers. But the reality and our experience is that at least 80% of our um, at least 80% of our customers' uh, cost of, of maintaining applications comes out of the operations space. And so Kubernetes and Google Container Engine are an operationally viable way to build these distributed applications. And it really moves our customers from thinking about deploying things into individual virtual machines to instead saying, hey, I'm just going to drop this into this cluster and it will all be wired together. So I can take these little Lego building blocks of Docker containers, piece them together in ways that are intuitive, and then have a very smart and effective system to run those for me on my behalf. So basically a pool of VMs could be available to a developer if I get this right. So you're saying, I'm a developer, I don't have to worry about dependencies by VMware, by VMware versus another form factor. I just let the container deal with that. Is that? Uh, and so what we've done, yes, that's exactly right. We've, we've created this, um, 
we've created this strong separation between infrastructure operations and application operations. And so Docker has created a portable framework to take a, a basically a binary and run it anywhere, which is an amazing capability. But that's not enough. You also need to be able to manage that with a framework that can run anywhere. And so the, the union of Docker and Kubernetes provides this framework where you're completely abstracted from the underlying infrastructure. You could use VMware, you could use Red Hat OpenStack um, deployment, you could run on another major cloud provider like Rackspace um, or IBM. And, uh, and you can just build this application and, and deploy it there and, and experience this very powerful cluster first way of, of, of building and managing that, that app. So cluster first, I haven't heard that one. <laughs> it's, a it's not a cluster, you know what, it's a, <laughs> it's a cluster, cluster first. first. It's a cluster. <laughs> yeah. That trumps uh, um, cloud first from Microsoft. But let's, let's go back to Kubernetes. So you named the product. What does it mean? I mean, it's kind okay. of a... You, you don't look at a tech name, you say, hey, it's not like Alpha One, you know. So, so Kubernetes is the Greek word for the helmsman of the ship. And so um, I was looking to uh, find a name, um, and turns out there's a lot of cluster management technologies and a lot of the obvious names were taken. Um, and so I had the inspiration of what is this doing? Um, it's, it's actually the thing that's, that's overseeing the whole of your operation and is planning what goes where and, and managing it. So Kubernetes is the helmsman of your cluster. It's the thing that manages. Did you design the algorithm to stay away from icebergs? <laughs> you know, and that's the key thing. You don't want to crash the system. Um, but that's the challenge. I mean, you know, just joking aside, orchestration is really a hard thing. So that's been a cloud phenomenon, automation. Everyone's been talking about, oh, we have management software that automates and orchestrates cloud resources. You know, but now in, in a cloud environment, it's more challenging now. So talk about what Kubernetes does different than older approaches to orchestration. Yeah. I, think, I think this is a very, very important consideration. When, when I look at the way that orchestration's been done traditionally, you tend to think about your application as being deeply tied to the underlying piece of infrastructure. So your orchestration process is provision me a basic machine, go get the packages I need, deploy my application pieces, wire it in explicitly to all the other pieces of my system. And so you have to kind of build this relatively fragile system where all the pieces are, are tied together and deeply coupled. What Kubernetes has done is provide a framework where you have a very principled, almost little Lego building block that you can stick together and say, I want one of these things, I want it replicated six times, and I want it wired into these other pieces without actually having to know about where those other pieces are deployed, how they relate to, uh, to one another. And so it really is realizing this highly decoupled, very principled way of thinking about your environment as a cluster where you just drop your, your packages in and they're all wired together using uh, virtualized networking and, and using this, this cluster-centric paradigm. And it radically, radically reduces the cost of operations. Um, I, I can just give you a, an example of that. In the old days of Google, uh, before we had these technologies inside the house, um, it was all we could do to keep the lights on. Like every, every day was an adventure. It was very hard because our, our operations had our application pieces deeply tied into the physical infrastructure. When we introduced a system internally known as Borg, we changed the game. In, in less than a year, Hold we on. Had, Name's Borg. what was it called? Borg? Borg. 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 Okay. Internally, internally known as Borg. <laughs> like connected to everything, like the Microsoft. Yeah, so Borg. it was the. Uh, I said Microsoft, but Microsoft is called. I think it's called Schwarzenegger, but that's all right. And, uh, <laughs> continue. I just want to make and, sure and we, literally, we heard that right. We literally doubled the number of production services we run within a year. It's just so much easier to run things at scale. So provisioning, managing, it just makes a smoother operation, smooth sailing. It's if really you trying to hide provisioning, managing, right? It's, you're, it's, you're basically, I have, a, I have an app and I just, I want to build it easily and then I want to deploy it easily and then I want it to be able to scale easily, easily yes. without having to go back and reconnect it to more stuff. So it, 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 it's funny because I think most people think that that's what clouds have already always done, right? This this basically compute, uh, networking, and storage that's just in small units virtually available to assemble, disassemble however I want. But you say I used to have to still assemble it and disassemble it. Now it's just it's just exactly it's that's just plugging in. And that's that's the challenge. You know the way we've seen cloud evolving has disappointed us a little bit because it really is just a remanifestation of the same existing first generation way of thinking about application development, application provisioning. Um, if you challenge a lot of the fundamental assumptions, if you really step back and think about, you know, is there a better way to do this? You know, if I have all this incredibly fungible resource that can, you know, turn up and turn down, is there a better way to build applications? And Kubernetes is our invitation to the community to, to participate in defining that thing. We think it is a better way to build applications. We, we know it because we've been doing this for 10 years and it works really well for So us. talk about the open source tank angle because one, Kubernetes is open source, but we've reported that live when we last chatted. 
Um, Docker has huge success with their open source model, and that's you know not well known in the main world how the nuance and developers really are engaged and motivated to play with Docker, which is has its own flywheel effect, which is very viral and network effect. What's your strategy with Kubernetes? Besides, is it standard open source blocking and tackling? Is there things you're doing to prime the pump? Is there a magical formula you guys are really nurturing and fostering? I, I'm very happy with uh, the way that the project's been run, and it's been humbling to see the amount of uh, adoption and success we've had. And I think that this, this manner of operating, where we build Kubernetes as an open source project with the community, and then we, we take it and take exactly that, and we turn it into a, a, a service and add a lot of high value capabilities to it, is a pattern that's working very well for us. It's, it's made us, it's massively increased our velocity because it's not just us that are actually developing the project. We have amazing contributions from people like Red Hat. They're, they're putting a lot of time and effort into making this thing great. Um, our friends at CoreOS are putting a lot of effort into it. And we're able to do more because it's just more people working on it. So the velocity is far higher. The second thing is that we were able to go straight to an open alpha. Normally we, we, we do these early adopter programs hidden behind the curtain, try to figure stuff out and, and, and do a lot of iteration. We didn't have to do that because the community has built the API with us. Our customers have been working directly with us to shape the API. We know it's going to work for them. And that's helped you guys. So your differentiation doesn't really conflict with the community. Absolutely not. And we recognize as we've moved from um, a cloud that's you know, worked mostly in the startup community and with internet facing companies to a cloud that's really engaging mainstream business, our customers want multi-cloud. It's, it's critical to them. They want to be able to run a hybrid cloud. They want to have multi-cloud provider relationships. They don't want to just rely on one provider. And so a framework that works well everywhere, but works especially well on Google, uh, serves our business very well. Get some great props on um, crowd chat. So uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Always great to chat with you. Um, you're in a hot area, we'd love to pick your brain, but I want to. I want you to address three things I'm going to say to you, get your thoughts on. Okay. It could be your Google perspective, it could be your own geeky perspective. Um, perimeterless, perimeterless IT, multi-cloud, and mobile infrastructure. Three of the hottest areas on the planet right now. In terms of people looking at investments, retooling, trying to figure things out, per, perimeterless IT. Obviously, perimeter IT, perimeter-based security sure. kind of goes away with the cloud, right? I mean, yeah. but you still need security. Is you know, it's perimeterless. So, what does that mean? I mean, how do people understand and grok that concept? So, so the idea. Of, um, so, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to speak to perimeterless IT, but you know, I can say just, that just in general. You know, when I when I think about it, I think there's a, there's a couple of things that are happening here that are, that are really interesting. When I look at the idea of perimeterless IT, when I look at the idea of what I consider the um, the democratization of IT, if you will. We've lived in a world where most businesses have been beholden to a, a specific organization that's controlled their provisioning, the policies, and you know the, the, the set of um, bits they can use. Everything's been controlled. And IT hasn't been well loved, um, by and large. We're moving into a world where it's a much more open ecosystem. Departments are far more empowered. Anyone with a, with a corporate credit card can go and get a machine. And that's 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 creating amazing agility and, and velocity for businesses, but it's introducing creativity a lot of creativity too, a lot of creativity. But it's introducing a lot of pain as well. And so the hard thing is going to be creating a, a a smart framework that allows empowered decentralization, going from this world of highly controlled to de decentralized empowerment. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of uh, interest from from folks that are operating in the uh, in the enterprise space. Okay, multi cloud. Just in general, will people move to multiple clouds? Do you see that? Uber clouds, we had Bit, Bitnami in earlier, like, ah, people aren't really going to multiple clouds. They're not interested in moving workloads. Is that a state of the, the current situation, or will it evolve to workloads anywhere? Um, Multi-cloud is the reality of our world. Like, there's, there's no serious customer I've spoken to in the last six months that has not been in, interested in multi-cloud relationship. Sorry, it's not true. There's no like enterprise customer I've spoken to in the last six months. That has not, that been, has interested. not been interested in multi-cloud. And the reason in is, some ways. is for what resource? There's, 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 a, there's a couple of reasons. One is a lot of companies want to have just a multi-provider relationship. They don't want to be beholden to a single cloud provider. And frankly, almost every customer I speak to has a massive investment of you know, in on-premise infrastructure. They want to move away from you know, a lot of the pain associated with managing that, but it's not going to happen overnight. And so hybrid cloud is going to exist for quite a while. This is back to your empowered decentralization theme. And we have to provide them the tools to do that. And we have to create positive pressure that moves them 
from those clouds to to the to the public. Cloud. Final concept, and I've heard this a lot, kind of weaved into the keynote, not necessarily the, the words, but the almost you know reeking of this of this concept of mobile infrastructure. I mean, mobile first, you mean cluster first, kind of enables you know, mobile first. But mobile is obviously a form factor, whether it's an Internet of Thing as a human or a device. Doesn't matter. It's still an endpoint in the network, yeah. and it's a multitude of, of millions of devices. So, what is mobile infrastructure? Is it different? Is it the same? What, what's your take? It's on? it's it's an interesting question, and the reality of our world is uh, it's 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 a mobile world. Um, you know, it's it's almost folly to do anything but think about mobile as the, the primary uh, vehicle for customers, consumers, and everyone else to interface with the internet, the web. Um, it certainly introduces an interesting set of challenges um, to to um, application developers, and I think you know one of the things that I'm most sort of interested in, in cracking from a cloud provider's perspective is is the world of multiple devices, where you have a, a large set of devices in different form factors that are ultimately presenting a view over the same set of data, the same set of information, and creating a set of experiences that work well in that multi-device space. So. Moving away where, from a world where state is bound to a device to a world where state is, is based in your cloud and your device is simply providing a view or a way to interface with that data. And we still have a way to go before that, that is fully materialized, but I think that's going to be a big um, sort of anchor point of um, a lot of, of mobile development in this space. So Craig, where's the locus of competition move then? If, if the data center just becomes a resource that's on tap, basically, that I can just get, where do the... How do the cloud providers then differentiate? So basic infrastructure is relatively undifferentiated. But when I look at the way that we run inside Google, we do some really, really scary um, smart things to make your application run for you. If you think about the way we run our infrastructure, it's almost like the flight controller of a modern airplane. Um, it's, it's, it's going from the old um, wire-based um, control system where you move something and move a flap to a world where you have this controller that's taking in millions of signals a second and making incredibly informed decisions that, that is optimizing the heck out of everything you do and making very fine-grained corrections. And I think that's going to be a huge avenue of differentiation. When you take an application, you package it, and you give it to us, and you trust us to run it for you, um, and we're able to, um, it's running at a slightly higher level with the stock, we have a much higher abstraction level. We can do incredibly smart things with things like machine learning technologies. We can watch how your application's running. We know how it ran last time, so we can tell if something's going wrong because we, we have the ability to actually watch that. This is how we run our internal workloads. Right, right. And, uh, and, and it's, it's not just about commodity infrastructure, it's going to be about like smart systems that run your application for you. And that's going to be hard so to do. It's really to abstract above the management of the application. It's actually the management yeah. of the application and the optimization of the application as opposed to it's, the application. There is so much more value in moving from static, dumb uh, infrastructure to actively managed, sort of precision managed, uh, container based capabilities. Um, it's, it's, it's quite jarring. Um, this was clear to me very, off, very soon after we shipped Google Compute Engine. Um, I was able to see, we never looked inside VMs, but we were able to see what level of CPU utilization our customers were getting. And uh, we compared that to what we were able to run on our internal workloads. And our customers were only getting, you know, like there were several in integer multiples less utilization than what they were paying for. And so we knew that something, that something could be done. We could actually move up the abstraction there and just do a better job by actively managing and making smart decisions. And that will be very disruptive. So let's let's play a game. We played a game with our last guest. We'll play the game of we're gonna you and I are gonna go into business together and be venture capitalists. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> sounds like so. Fun. What's our investment thesis? Get knowing what we know. I mean, there's a lot of work. That, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, really looking at the enterprise right now. And the enterprise is hard. Cloud is kind of like a proxy for the enterprise, but it's not like your classic enterprise. I'm a tech entrepreneur. I'm a coder. I'm an architect. I'm an OS guy, systems guy. I could be a creative filmmaker, whatever, but I want to come in and make some, get some white space. Is there white space out there that you see that is an opportunity for developers that could really come in and, and stay claim and build a really good business? Could be a lifestyle business, could be a home run. Where do you where would we invest? Yeah, I mean I think there's I think there's 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 so much white space in this in this domain. Um, you know we are we are in the very early days of of, of getting these technologies to market. Um, you know obviously there's just bolstering the basic the sort of the fundamentals of the platform. So um, overlay networking, um, everyone's talking SDN, obviously there's a lot of hype around that, but being able to create a, an abstraction that allows you know, high levels of pluggability for different network fabrics as you move between clouds is interesting. Storage and doing a better job of providing virtualized storage that is available to these containers is, a, is an area of opportunity. There's a lot of work to be done in the tooling environment, you know, uh, 
allowing full-on application lifecycle management, continuous integration, lots of opportunity in that space. And then frankly, as we start looking at taking these technologies to market and taking them to, and deploying them into real businesses that are running multi-cloud, there's going to be a lot of the governance, risk management and compliance overlay capabilities that just don't exist. We have the ability to define policy and enforce it in a very effective way, whether it's security policy, data loss prevention policy, update But it has policy. to be dynamic, right? And it has to be dynamically done, and it has to be enforced at the node. And uh, that's there's software. Just, there's that's so hard. Much, that's hard software. And there's so much work to be done there, and there's like there's so many opportunities to either create, you know, niche, vertically, you know, oriented capabilities that service a specific vertical, or unique, highly valuable cross-cutting capabilities. I, I'm very excited about the future. So where would we get started if I was an entrepreneur? Like, hey, great, great. I, I saw your interview. Where do I get started? Just writing, writing app engine code. If I want to put the boat in the water and start drifting into this area we just mentioned. Well, how should I navigate in? How should I vector in? A lot of it depends on, on you know, where you're going to be, um, you know, where you're going to be operating in the stack. Um, you know, I would suggest you go and learn Go. Um, Go is, is rapidly, Golang, if you, if you want to talk about yeah. the sort of the development environment, is rapidly emerging as the language for the new cloud. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of work in the, in the Go community. Um, Docker is written in Go, Kubernetes is written in Go. So I'd start there. Um, it's it's a great platform for uh, it's a great platform for systems development. And so I would start looking at you know some of the existing technologies, Docker, um, Kubernetes, and I start just assessing where the gaps are. And, and I would I'd probably approach it from a systems development perspective if I was doing it. But there's also going to be a lot of value higher up the chain where you can yeah. actually you can dance around the top of the stack and around the stack. Absolutely. All right. So final question: Are we going back to the old OS days? And we were joking before we came on. Um, conversationally in, in a way that was pretty relevant. I mean, we're seeing concepts of systems programming of the 80s, kind of, but in decentralized way. Comment on that, because I think that's I think, I think tying a, a lot of things together. That's an incredibly astute observation, and I think we're, we're moving in a, away from a world, operating system today is a node local thing, right? So I have an operating system, and it's, it's providing an environment that abstracts me from the physical details of one piece of hardware, one machine, you know, one, one set of resources. And what we're starting to see now is the emergence of some of these distributed concepts where you're programming not to a specific piece of, you know, a single piece of infrastructure, single piece of hardware, but you're programming to a cluster. And so I think it's very much like that. I think that's a, a very astute observation. And we're going to see the positive. But no one vendor owns it. It's owned by the world. And nor should one. Um, it, it, it needs to be a POSIX-like ubiquitous framework that lets us get more out of these cluster-centric applications. Very organic. I mean, I love the, what's happening is a very organic development, but yet there's some kind of group dynamics going on around clustering around. Docker's a great example. Came out of the woodwork to become a de facto standard. Probably the fastest de facto standard that I've ever seen. Get it uh, it's been seat. breathtaking how quickly that technology I mean, just, And that's just the, the crowd. Yeah. Just saying, hey, if we don't like decide on something, we like these guys the best. They didn't piss anyone off or whatever. Whatever the dynamic is, it could be the open source flywheel. But it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, certainly from Google's perspective, we we noticed Docker a lot sooner than most of the world did, and we we had technologies that we could have stood up as potentially competing capabilities, but we chose not to because the world is incredibly well served by a single standard for uh, defining and packaging applications. Now we need to continue that and we need to build the standard for the, the, the POSIX like distributed system standard that people think about coding to when they're building these, these modern next gen cloud V2 applications. Craig, I really appreciate you spending the time. Love the conversation, love kind of the long windy road we took there. We knocked out some Kubernetes, we talked about Docker and containers, we talked about the future of the industry. Really appreciate it. You're awesome, awesome to have on theCUBE. You're invited anytime. CUBE alumni, Craig McLucky, right on theCUBE. We'll be right back here live in San Francisco, broadcasting exclusively from Google's developer conference here, the Cloud Platform Live event from Google. We'll be right back after this short break.